Hi, I'm Scav, and this video is going to teach you everything you need to know about how to use the Instrument Landing System, or ILS, to get on the ground safely in adverse conditions. In the interest of keeping things short and sweet, I'll be emphasizing how the systems work rather than the details of air traffic procedure. An ILS approach works in principle like almost any other approach except using the instruments to indicate the location of the airfield instead of looking at the canopy. In particular, these instruments are the Horizontal Situation Indicator, or HSI, and the Attitude Director Indicator, or ADI. Before we start talking about the instruments themselves, there are two things we'll need in order to use the ILS, the ILS radio frequency, and the heading of the runway we plan to use. The most straightforward way is to look at the kneeboard by pressing right shift K. Use the bracket keys until you find the page for your desired airfield, in this case Coppoletti. Then note the runway heading, 064, and the ILS frequency, 111.5. You can also use the divert page in the CDU. Press function, then 2 to bring up the nav page, then divert. Then select your airfield. The runway number is usually the runway heading in tens of degrees, though remember it's rounded off so it won't be as precise. Also, selecting an airfield on the divert page will automatically select its steer point as well. There are a few things we need to do to set up the aircraft for an ILS approach. First, we need to set the ILS radio to the frequency we just found. The ILS radio is on the right side of the cockpit, toward the back, and the frequency is set by using the mouse wheel to turn the knobs. Right-click on the left knob to turn the radio on, and listen for the station ID in Morse code. You can also click and right-click on the rightmost knob to change the volume so it doesn't get annoying. Next, we need to look at the Navigation Mode Select panel under the HSI. Press the ILS button so it's illuminated, and flip the pointer switch from Stow to Able to enable the ADI's steering cue bars. Now let's talk about the HSI. There are three components of the HSI to be aware of here. First is the bearing pointer, which will always point directly toward the selected steer point, which while landing ought to be the airfield. The top left corner also shows the distance to the selected steer point. Second, the desired course arrow. Our final desired course will be straight down the runway, which we previously found was 064. We'll set that with the course knob on the bottom right. Finally, the course deviation indicator, which shows the offset between the desired course and the current steer point. In other words, if we were to immediately turn on to our desired course, how much we would miss the steer point by. See how the offset bar moves to the center as the aircraft reaches the intercept point? and it moves off to the opposite side as I fly past it. The objective is to use the HSI to fly to a point a few miles directly off the end of the runway, so the bearing pointer and the desired course arrow are in alignment, and then turn toward the airfield for final approach. Mostly this is a matter of spatial awareness and understanding what your instruments are telling you, but here are a couple of common pitfalls. First, resist the temptation to fly directly at the steer point unless you're already on final. Otherwise, you'll end up landing sideways, which isn't helpful. Also, if the bearing pointer and the course arrow are pointing in opposite directions, you'll probably have to fly past the airfield and double back. A directly reciprocal course, that is, a course parallel to the runway but in the opposite direction, should take you where you want to go. If you're completely out of ideas, calling inbound to ATC will give you a suggested heading, though they may guide you to a rather short approach which isn't ideal in poor visibility. Once you've almost reached alignment, turn toward your desired course. At this point, you should begin paying attention to the ADI and the steering cue bars. The steering bars will indicate a particular bank and pitch to get you lined up fully with the runway, so try to keep them centered. Note that they can only indicate relatively conservative maneuvers, so if you notice the course deviation bar on the HSI is leaving without you, a more radical maneuver may be necessary. This is why it's important to set up your approach with the HSI before trusting yourself to the steering bars. Note also the glide slope indicator to the left of the ADI. During most of your initial approach, it will have a red flag indicating that it's not receiving any signal. But as you prepare for final approach, it should activate and show your altitude versus the desired altitude for a 3 degree descent onto the runway. If the indicator is above the center, 
That means you're lower than expected, but that's okay. Just by maintaining level flight, the glide slope will come down to meet you. If the indicator is below the center, you will need to dive down to meet it. The horizontal pitch cue bar won't appear unless the aircraft is fairly close to the correct glide path. A good rule of thumb is you should be 300 feet above the airfield's elevation for every mile away from it. So starting a 4 mile approach from 1000 feet should put you a little low and in good position to intercept. Once you're on the correct path, you should be stabilized much like in a visual landing. The forward velocity vector will be at minus 3 on the pitch ladder and slightly but directly below the steer point. Remember that the steer point is midfield on the runway, aiming toward it will leave you a very short rollout. There are also marker beacons that will illuminate a light on the front dash and make a sound as you pass over them. These let you know that you're on the right path and are closing in with the runway. The inner marker in particular is there to let you know that you should be able to see the runway visually soon, so make sure you have a good landing speed and are ready to flare. Of course, anyone can do this at noon on an ideal summer's day. Let's make things a little more interesting. Okay, things may seem placid here at 11,000 feet, but below the cloud layer is a whiteout snowstorm. The radios and course are already set, so we'll put the airfield steer point off the aircraft's 10 o'clock and begin the descent. Using the IFFCC test page, I'll go into display modes and turn on the radar altimeter tape so there's an easy visual reference for altitude above ground level. Done here for demonstration purposes, usually I would do it during startup. It's important to set the speed brakes to about one-third extension, and leave them there for the entire approach. It's particularly important to do so in a low visibility landing, because of the greater likelihood of needing to abort, for example, due to a missed approach or an occupied runway. You get more thrust more quickly from closing the brakes and advancing the throttle from a higher setting, than from just pushing the throttle from a low setting. About 5 miles distant from the airfield, I'm turning perpendicular to the course arrow so that I'm heading directly to the intercept point rather than extending further. This will get me where I want to go faster than just continuing on, although the latter would work eventually. Skipping ahead slightly to the turn in, the glide slope indicator is awake and, as expected, I'm rather low. I've also slightly overshot the point where the ADI bars can guide me, so about halfway through the turn I'll start turning harder and deliberately go past the desired course. Afterward, the steering bars will help me correct my path. The glide slope indicator is starting to come down, and soon the other steering bar will activate. All that will be left at that point is to keep them centered despite the turbulence, and then final touchdown. Here's the outer marker. Altitude, altitude.
And that's everything you need to know about ILS. I'm Skev, good luck and good hunting.